Chicago skyline, five miles south of the one most people know. This is Robert Taylor Homes, the largest housing project in the world, the poorest urban community in the United States. But for the people who lived here and died here and all that, I do think they deserve some sort of commemoration. To understand the development of Robert Taylor Homes, we need to first take into consideration the systematic oppression of black Americans that led to the social organization. The problems of black organization arises from the beginning of World War I in which America experienced a halt in urban and housing development. Prior to the war with a prosperous economy, the housing movement allowed white America to improve the social status by moving to more funded and supported neighborhoods. In their absence, they left behind poor living conditions, but this gave black Americans the opportunity to migrate to the cities. Though there was a growing housing tension, both parties were able to live. However, at the start of the war, the housing expansion stopped, but black migration continued in the cities. This led to movements of blacks into white neighborhoods across the United States, which was viewed as an invasion and was met with increased social tension and enforcement of housing policies. We want to keep what we have. And I'm sure my father and mother has worked their life. You don't want to see their property value go down because if a black come in there, that will go down like that. Of the policies of racial discrimination, restrictive covenants were used by white neighborhood homeowner associations in order to keep homes in white areas from being sold to black families. Furthermore, this negative sentiment of white communities toward black communities is seen through the concept of white flight. The presence of black families would lead to a mass exodus of the previous white inhabitants of the neighborhood. This led to the development of the white suburbs as a separate entity of the chocolate city. Additionally, the practice of bank redlining was used by realtors to literally define a boundary within which black families could be denied bank services or insurance. So he looked at me, looked around, and he said to me, he says, listen, it's not me, but the owners of this development have not as yet decided to sell these homes to Negroes. They can't sell to you. You know, I, I was really on an up. Man, look at this house. Can you imagine having this? And then for them to tell me because of the color of my skin, I can't be a part of it. Not only did this bar black families from taking out housing loans, it also blocked commercial investment in redlined areas. Redlining therefore impacted the economies of black communities due to discriminatory investment. This formed black communities into monetary deserts and uplifted surrounding white areas as thriving cities. Often leading to additional disparities in health outcomes, black communities became food deserts with little to no access to affordable, healthy food options. The study of black neighborhoods and communities has consistently shown the detrimental impact of flawed federal policies. For example, various housing policies were implemented over multiple presidencies starting from the New Deal and the Housing Act of 1937 mandating federal funding to low-income neighborhoods, followed by the Fair Deal and the Housing Act of 1949 which attempted to increase the power of federal housing administration as well as promoting public housing development. Another noteworthy housing act was the Housing and Urban Development Act of 1965, which expanded federal housing programs within suburban and urban areas. Despite these attempts to combat the federal housing crisis, the issue of housing inequality was not being addressed as seen with the Fair Housing Act of 1968, written to ban discrimination in housing. The passage of this law reveals that the policies implemented from the New Deal onwards were not serving black communities, given the ne necessity for an explicit ban on discrimination. The Fair Housing Act did not alleviate all forms of housing in inequality, but reveals the severity of past discrimination. One of the most prominent case studies that highlights the unattended housing crisis is the construction of Robert Taylor Homes. Robert Taylor, the head of the Chicago Housing Authority and the founder of the homes, wanted to revitalize and develop the city. The idea for a better, safer, affordable, and more integrated community, although seemed like a great idea, ended up turning into one of the most poor and crime-ridden neighborhoods in the U.S. Instead of making an integrated public space for all communities, the Robert Taylor Homes turned into a place for alienation of low-income, mostly African-American individuals. These individuals who resided in this space were typically fresh out of the carceral system and needed a place to go. As a result, the mass influx of people made the homes overcrowded and poorly managed, leading to the quick deterioration of the facilities and a huge increase in crime. One example of how this happened was that children resorted to using elevators, bathrooms, and the train yard as playgrounds due to the degraded nature of the public parks. 
This would lead to the further deterioration of those facilities as well, and then the cycle continued until the whole neighborhood suffered from detrimental living conditions. Furthermore, with public sentiment being that the neighborhood was full of criminals, the CHA worked to fund policing, security checkpoints, fences on balconies, and cameras around the community instead of working to raise the standards of living. They decided to further alienate an entire population of African Americans by making the urban plan of the homes to mimic that of the prison, resulting in not only isolation of the community, but isolation within the community as well. This architecture can be seen throughout most projects in the U.S. and just highlights the overall segregation of African American individuals. Overall, it is clear that keeping black Americans segregated from the majority white population meant more to the government than the actual well-being of the people living in this community. In 2007, the last building in Robert Taylor Homes was demolished and a new federal housing development took its place, again attempting to create a mixed income community in the south side of Chicago. But still, the housing crisis continues to leave black Americans searching for a place to call home, specifically urban black Americans who continue to become victims of gentrification as white flight reverses and white residents seek urban neighborhoods that have historically been predominantly inhabited by minorities. As a result, gentrification has led to the devastation and dispersion of black neighborhoods that were once cohesive. The racial turnovers caused by gentrification have resonating effects because displaced black families move to find refuge in new cities, towns, and neighborhoods in search of home. This persistent cycle shapes the geography of black America both historically and currently. The message is to like not overlook people's trauma. It's to not think that like being dispersed, having your home erased is an easy thing to go through. Do what they get out, say, don't engage in horseplay, people speak in tongues.